student's legs pretty often. So he said to us one day when there was a bottle of fermenting beer on the table, that stuff would run your car. And I looked at him and said, ah, you're lying to us this time. And when I went to the library, what I discovered was an enormous history of alcohol running vehicles that I had no idea even existed. He wasn't pulling your leg. No, not at all. In fact, alcohol was the first uh, auto fuel before gasoline was really? ever invented. Really? Yeah, gasoline came later. The internal combustion engine came first. So... Um, Basically, you could get alcohol at any farm in the United States because they all had distilleries. And it wasn't until much later that gasoline became, um, you know, very common in the cities as a byproduct of uh, the fledgling oil industry at the time, which was really in the business of heating and lighting homes, you know, oh. replacing whale oil and okay. lard and that kind of thing. Okay. And uh, the stuff that was too volatile for oil, for oil lamps that would make them explode, well, Rockefeller flushed that into the rivers at night. And that's the stuff we nowadays call gasoline. It was the toxic waste of right, the oil business. Right, right. And today, gasoline is still the toxic waste of the oil business. We're paying to dispose of big oil's toxic residues. Ooh. There's no two days in a row is gasoline ever alike. It's whatever's left over for making more valuable things from oil. So here we are burning the planet's atmosphere with stuff that's the waste. Totally the waste of the so, oil industry. So why didn't we... Why... Okay. So if we were using alcohol for internal combustion machines, how come, I mean, is it just because, why aren't we doing that now? Well, you know, it's an interesting battle in the early part of the 1900s, you know, who was going to be the dominant fuel in it. And Henry Ford thought alcohol should be, because as Henry Ford used to say, if we can't be the farmer's customer, how can he be ours? And of course, alcohol was made from farm products. Sure. Uh, Rockefeller had a different opinion about this, and they tussled over this quite a bit. And finally, Rockefeller decided to stop playing fair. So what he did is he funded a, a splinter group of crazy old ladies called the Women's Christian Temperance Movement, and he gave them $4 million in 1915. And with $4 million, uh, you can very easily buy Congress at that time, and that's what happened. And what we got was a piece of legislation that was not a simple bill that just passed by a vote. It was a constitutional amendment called the Volstead Act, otherwise known as Prohibition. Prohibition. So alcohol was taken off the market, not just as beverage, but as for any use. And for 16 years, Rockefeller had competition-free uh, access to the market, and gasoline became entrenched as our, our motor fuel, even though it never was um, wow. the preferred fuel. Wow. As the oil gushed skyward, fantastic stories appeared of instant fortunes. Among the Cleveland businessmen lured to the region was John D. Rockefeller. He was no wildcatter. He saw that drilling for oil was a very risky business. Refining, not drilling, he decided, was where the steady money was to be made. Soon a new rail line linked Cleveland with the oil region. Rockefeller built his refinery right beside it. It was one of the first in the city to produce kerosene, a new fuel for lamps that was cheap and clean. The poor man's light, as John D. called it, would bring a brilliant glow into American homes. The soaring demand for it, he was convinced, would make him rich. I shall never forget how hungry I was in those days, he later wrote. I ran up and down the tufts of freight cars. I hurried up the boys. Obsessed with the business of oil, he mastered every detail, developed new products to sell. By age 25, his refinery was one of the largest in the world. In a move that would transform the American economy, Rockefeller set out to replace a world of independent oil men with a giant company controlled by him. In 1870, begging bankers for more loans, he formed Standard Oil of Ohio. On May 15, 1911, the Supreme Court of the United States declared that Standard Oil was a monopoly in restraint of trade and should be dissolved. As Rockefeller foresaw, the individual Standard Oil companies were worth more than the single corporation. 
In the next few years, their shares doubled and tripled in value. By the time the reign of cash was over, Rockefeller had the greatest personal fortune in history, nearly 2% of the American economy. Rockefeller's lucky streak was not over yet. Just as the electric light bulb threatened to wipe out the need for kerosene, the automobile appeared. The market for gasoline sparked euphoria in the oil industry. Rockefeller's soaring fortunes made it seem as if he had outwitted his critics again. People are talking about biodiesel and ethanol and, and other several alternatives, but those are the two hottest. You hear more about biodiesel. Why aren't we hearing about ethanol? Well, it's very interesting. Biodiesel, I ran my first tractor on biodiesel back in 1978. And uh, the thing about biodiesel versus ethanol in terms of why one is getting attention, not the other, is that uh, biodiesel does not have any effect whatsoever on oil companies. If we took oh. all the oil that we currently get from plants, you know, from corn, from soybeans, from whatever, we would only replace 2% of the diesel fuel that we currently use. So it's not a threat to the oil companies. Let me think. 2%? If we use all, all of those plants instead of for food? All that vegetable oil, yes. You've got to realize that plants are very good at making carbohydrates. They take carbon dioxide from the air and water, so carbon, hydrogen, okay. you know, carbohydrates, mix it with solar energy, and plants start off by making sugar from these things. Okay. Sugar gets built up into other things in the plant. For instance, it can be made into starch, which is 35 sugars together. Or thousands of sugars in a chain make cellulose. But a little more complex chemistry takes that sugar and makes it into vegetable oil. But it's an energy-intensive process for the plant. Okay. So an acre of soybeans will only produce about 48 gallons of biodiesel, very low yield. Okay. When it comes to alcohol, though, Plants make sugar and starch really well, and we can be looking at yields as low as 300 gallons an acre for corn to maybe 10,000 gallons an acre for um, cattails grown in sewage. So the no. ability for plants to turn that sunlight into chemical energy is much greater when we're looking for sugar and not oil. So, so instead of 250 gallons an acre, which we would get from corn, wild cattails would give us maybe 2,500 gallons per acre. But in... 500 places in the United States, we now have sewage treatment plants that use cattails as the final stage in sewage treatment to pull the nutrients out of the water before they discharge into rivers or the ocean. Under those circumstances, we actually get yields of 7,500 gallons per acre. And if you start including the cellulose potential, which is now becoming practical, it can be as high as 12,000 gallons an acre. So if we started processing all the sewage or most of the sewage in the United States, to a, a better quality discharge than we do now using cattail marshes. We could supply the whole country with alcohol just from cattails on less than 2% of what would be considered farmland in the United States. So, you know, when we start looking at some of these um, gifts of nature, like cattails that can provide us with fermentable good stuff, uh, the, the future is pretty bright indeed. Uh, where I live on coastal areas, uh, one of the things that I have been promoting quite a bit is something that most Norwegian fishermen know, which is you can make whiskey from kelp, kelp, the ocean plant that grows off our, you know, colder coastal waters. And there's other ones that grow in warmer water. So uh, the American Gas Association took a look at kelp off of California and said, well, if we set up Chinese style kelp farms, which are floating nets that we grow the kelp on, and the kelp grows like 18 inches a day, you can actually cut that kelp once a week, and it just keeps growing. Well, they figured that we could replace about two-thirds of the gasoline we use in the country just from the California coast's, um, you know, artificial kelp farms if we put those in. So you can't, you know, you wouldn't think of the American Gas Association as a bunch of tree-hugging environmentalists. These guys are, you know, dollars and cents, um, you know, energy people, and they see it as really uh, a way of doing it. And here we are not planting a single seed on soil and replacing most of the fuel in the United States. Now, 